Let's welcome in Fred Albert. He is the president of the American Federation of Teachers West Virginia chapter. Good morning, Fredo. How are you, sir? Good morning, Rob. I'm well. Good morning, John and Matt. It's good, good to morning. be with you all. Good morning. Good to have you, sir. I'm not sure if you happen to catch Senate President Craig Blair in the open discussing the tax cut bill and the $2,300 raise for all state employees that if the House agrees with the bill and the governor signs it, would kick in July the 1st in the next fiscal year. And it, Craig, during that uh, same segment, uh, also said that $2,300 would help offset some of the coming increases in PEIA. Fred, let's, let's talk about uh, first PEIA and your thoughts on the $2,300 raise that uh, will be offsetting what appears to be some certain premium increases. Sure, and I was able to catch uh, President Blair's uh, comments, and I was here at the Capitol on Saturday when uh, that bill did pass through the uh, Senate, and I'm here at the Capitol again this morning, so I hope I have pretty good reception. Sound great. But, uh, you know, there's a lot to be said about the uh, Senate Bill 268 that's now over in the House somewhere, um, and we're very thankful. Let me let me begin by saying, you know, the governor, uh, Governor Justice, has said under his watch, um, the time he has served as governor and until the end of his uh, term, that premiums for PEIA participants would not go up. Uh, and that that includes not just school teachers and service personnel, but all public employees. Uh, about 230,000 uh, PEIA plan participants. And we're grateful for what the governor has done. But there are more things besides premiums that uh, since 2017, I believe it may be the correct year, uh, while the premiums haven't, they've you know, roughly remained pretty much the same, uh, other deductions like out-of-pocket uh, maximums have increased uh, other costs to the participants have gone up. And and I also want to say we're very, very grateful for a pay raise for all public employees, school teachers, service personnel, and public employees of $2,300. But I did talk with a service personnel lady just yesterday who um, will be paying about, I think, 2400 and some dollars a year because her husband is on her plan and there is a marriage what we're calling a marriage penalty um, because her husband um, is on her plan she will be making well she will be paying more than her pay raise so yes the pay raise will help to offset for some but not for everyone and you know someone made the comment um, and I can't recall right now who made it but they said PEIA is not broken. We're always talking about, about a PEIA fix. We don't need to fix it. We need to finance it. And that's that's what we need to happen. Uh, we need to see that happen. And we don't need to finance it on the back of some of the lower paid people in our state. In regards to financing it, Fred, what would be... I, I don't think even you are saying that premiums for employees should never increase. No, no, we're not saying that because that that's to be expected. But, and yeah. we know that, you know, that's got to happen at some point. But, my goodness, it's going to happen this year if this bill goes through. Um, by July 1, uh, the participants, the active participants, are going to see a 26% premium increase. That's pretty drastic all at once. I have a health care insurance expert in the room with me right now with Jonathan Bodwell and Bodwell Associates. John? Well, let me just say that the teachers and state employees have had a, a great deal on health insurance for a long time. Before Obamacare came through 2012, I was paying about 550 a month for health insurance for myself and three children. Uh, last year, I paid $1,963 a month for myself and two college-age children. The cost of health insurance has gone through the roof. The yep. state employees, teachers, and otherwise have not had to really experience that. And unfortunately, they're going to have to. And even 26% of the low premium that they're paying is still not much. And I was paying 1960 for a plan with a, a uh, $7,000 maximum out of pocket per person. This is what happens. Elections have consequences. 
Obamacare happened. Health insurance went through the roof. Small businesses dropped health insurance. Individuals dropped health insurance because it was so expensive. People became uninsured. Teachers have been insulated from it. I mean, a 26% raise, I don't know what the average teacher pays, but 26% of not much is still not much. Fred, what is the average premium for a state employee on PEIA? That, that I really don't have in front of me, but I could tell you that the average teacher salary in West Virginia, the last figure I saw is, and we're talking about the average, and this is for some who have been in the system for many, many years, is about $59,000. I think it's $52,000. I could, I could be wrong on that figure, but I also want to say that we were given good health insurance, or our health insurance was provided to us over the years in lieu of pay raises because there were many, many, many years that we did not have a pay raise. And we're talking about the the lady that I mentioned. She has worked as a service personnel for 26 years, and she makes $31,000. Oh, no, I agree so with you there. Compare, that it's, it's definitely been in lieu of... her salary to someone else's salary in the private sector, you know, <laughs> for her to have to pay that amount of money a year, that's going to that's gonna be hard for her. Well, it's it's unfortunately many, many hard for everybody because the, the cost has gone through the roof. Something needs to be done nationally to figure it out. The cost of health care has gone through the roof. I agree with you. But then you look at the factory worker who's making 800 bucks a week, making $20 an hour, and they are paying, you know, five $600 every two weeks for health insurance for their families. Health insurance everywhere has gone through the roof. Um, I mean, I hope the state can fix it. I believe the teachers should be making a lot more money. I mean, a heck of well, a lot more money than they do. But it's it's unfortunate that, that the cost of everything has gone up here in America. It is. It's very unfortunate, but it is what we're living with. And to your point, you know, if our teachers were making the salaries that and our service personnel, I'm, I'm including them in our educators, and our state employees. We're talking about state troopers. We're talking about uh, health care workers, uh, correction officers. Uh, those are tough, tough jobs, and, and they're all underpaid right now. And then they're faced with a 26% increase. We're not saying premiums shouldn't go up, but to have a hit like that all at once. 26% is, is a lot. Yeah, that, uh, that's quite a bit. But we've we've seen this coming. You know, we've said for many, many years now, let's sit down at the table and look for a funding source. Let's let's talk together. And we did have something called the, the PEIA task force that sort of just went away. And I think there were people who served. I did not at that time. The people who were serving on that task force had some great ideas that never came to fruition. So. I think it's time to come back to the table, look at, we, you know, we hear every day how our surplus is in West Virginia uh, more than it's ever been. It's historic figures. So it looks like we have some money there that could help finance this situation. Matt Miller. Fred, you m mentioned earlier the, of the particular service uh, personnel that you spoke with that, that part of the issue was the cost because of a spouse being on PEIA. -E uh, say that three times fast. Um, <laughs> right. it, 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 can, can you give us an idea of, of how the, that insurance works as far as a teacher or a service personnel having a spouse or a family on their plan? Well, uh from what I've gathered, they're going to have to pay what is called a penalty. If they, if they have insurance that is offered, if their spouse has insurance that's offered by their employer, a different employer, but they choose to be on the PEIA plan with their spouse, they're going to have to pay a monthly penalty of 100, I think it's, someone said $147 a month extra in, in addition to the premium increase. Um, so that's all that I really know about that situation at this point. And there's, there's still more in this bill. I mean, it's a pretty uh, large bill that we're still sifting through and trying to find out uh, all of the details, uh, as I'm sure everyone else is doing. Um, but, for instance, uh, under the Senate Bill 268, according to the PEIA officials, if a person is making $45,000 a year with family coverage, 
and they have to pay this marriage penalty, they'll also have to pay an additional $2,672 next year for PEIA coverage. So that that's a big chunk for them, and that's more than the $2,300 pay raise. Well, let me, let me ask a question. If somebody is a spouse of a state employee, a teacher's spouse, mm-hmm. and they're being offered coverage by their employer, why should they go on the teacher's insurance? Why should they receive some sort of a subsidy from the state when they're not? The, you, you were talking about how private sector employees are making more money, they have more opportunities. This person is working for a private employer and is having to pay for their health insurance there. It's not really a penalty. It's saying, hey, if, if you don't want to take your employer coverage that you are offered and you want to come here, it's going to cost you a little bit more because the state's having to pony up a little bit more money for somebody who's not an employee, for somebody who's a spouse and is offered coverage by their private sector employer that they're working for. Why shouldn't they just automatically have to do that? Well, I think that's a personal decision that you know each family would have to make, and I don't know all of their their reasons for doing that. Maybe the insurance that's being offered by their employer is not as uh, much of a benefit. Maybe it doesn't provide all of the same things that the PEIA insurance plan that offers them. And it, but it also costs them might cost them more money than the PEIA because the PEIA should be. I mean, I I personally believe that PEIA should be no charge. There should be no premium for the employee across the state, be it teacher, service personnel, anyone else. That would be expensive. But I believe that they should be paying full boat whatever it costs on actual cost of insurance for spouses and children, just like it is with a lot of private sector companies where well and you know that's one of the things that i go back to let's let's call people together who are involved in this and and sit at the table and hash all of these things out uh and and see what we can come up with the other thing that i want to mention is if you're living in a bordering county and you have to go out of state you know what what i know what the plan is trying to do and that's to bring us back to an 80 20 uh, funding source, right. uh, 80% for the employer, 20% for the employee. But if you're living in a bordering state and you have to go out of, or a bordering county and you have to go out of state to get a particular surgery or um, service from a provider that you don't have access to, that's going to be a 70 30. Um, the employer would pay 70% of that and the employee would pay 30%. That, right. That's another. Um, kind of a tough thing to have to deal with because you just live in a certain place and you don't have access to a particular health care in your area. Before we run out of time, I want to move off of PEIA to make sure we cover a few other bills as well that are education-related. Senate Education Bill uh, uh, 638, SB 638, which creates a new incentive for Tier 2 teachers to be in the classroom rather than burning personal days they might otherwise lose. And this is through an option of selling back personal days Fred, how has that progressed to the Senate? Is it something you think the House would sign once it gets through the Senate, if it does? I, I believe that is a good thing because, you know, it used to be that way. Um, and I think that would help us with a few things. The, the substitute shortage, it would help us with uh, teachers, younger teachers, who don't have any uh, way to, you know, bank those days. Well, they can bank those days, but when they leave employment for whatever reason, retirement or whatever, those days mean nothing to them, so they're of the mindset, I'm going to go ahead and take those days. It's, those are my days to take. I don't necessarily think that same way because I'm in the older system where I have accrued 300 and some uh, sick days. And so when I leave, when I retire, I can use those days to buy service, which is, that's a good thing. And it's kept, it, it makes you think twice before you just take a day. So I think that would be uh, something that would be beneficial to uh, teachers. It would also help. It's another attractive uh, benefit that may help with our teacher shortage that we're experiencing. And, Fred, the Third Grade Success Act. Tell me what the future of that bill is. Well, that's a good question. I know that it was in the Senate. Uh, I believe it's in the House. You know, of course, tomorrow is we have 10 days after today of this session tomorrow is what is called crossover day. It is, um, I believe the last account of that, it was in house, uh, probably will come to the floor uh, real soon. And 
I think that's a good thing. I think that is going to help with student achievement. It's going to help our educators uh, in their jobs. So I, I hope that bill does pass. But we have 10 days after today to get those things done. Back to you, Matt Miller. Is that going to be a challenge, do you believe, Fred, being able to fill some of those positions well, at a time when we're already having trouble maybe finding I, teachers? I'm, I'm sure it will be. I'm sure it will be. But hopefully, you know, we're, we're doing some things to attract uh, new blood, some young teachers. And hopefully it will be something that uh, can be filled. But I, I agree we're having a hard time already. This year we have like 1,544 uh, vacancies filled by certified teachers, but they're not necessarily certified in the field they're, the discipline where they're teaching. But uh, that could that could be a problem, but it would be a good problem to try to find an answer to. And what do you know about these school safety units, Fred? Uh, I'm not sure what you're talking about, school right. safety units. So they're, they're talking about this. I, I guess it's in regards to some of the incidents that take place in schools and they're discussing putting together some type of school safety unit that would deal with these situations. Well, I know that Rob Cunningham, I believe he's in charge of Homeland Security for our schools. I've, I've heard him make presentations in both Senate education and House education. And uh, Ron Arthur is also a gentleman who is working with him. And I believe they're, they're looking at six different areas. Um, if, you know, this session, has been full of lots of bills. 275, my last count, education bills were introduced. 82 of those needed a fiscal note. But I think what you're talking about is looking at our schools and making sure they are safe places for our students to attend and our teachers to teach in those schools and our service personnel to work there. So I think anything that we can do to make our schools much safer and keep our students safe would be a good thing. It's HB 3369. It would be create a school safety unit within the State Division of Protective Services. Right. So Uh, I'm pretty sure that's the the bill that um, Rob Cunningham has been talking about. And I think yes, it is. It is. It, it, we've got to make our schools safe places. They should be, you know, students shouldn't have to fear when they go to school and parents shouldn't have to fear uh, whether their children will be able to come home safely at the end of the day. They, they should be places full of fun and learning and, and everyone should have that safe feeling in the school. Matt Miller. When you look at what has gone on so far in this legislative session, would you say that it has been a a win for education, or is it still too early kind of to tell? Well, you know, it's it's a little bit too early because things will happen very quickly now from now until the end of the session, which ends at midnight on the 11th of March. So I think it's a little bit it, – it's when you're in the midst of all of this, it's, it's still somewhat um, – hard to digest everything that's happening because bills do get amended and you have to keep up on that and we try to do that we do a daily update uh for our members but i think we have to wait uh, usually till the very last minute to make sure everything that uh is has passed and and how did it pass what was amended so it's it's still a little bit early to tell but the clock is ticking 10 days after today. So we'll know more on March the 11th at, after midnight. Hey, let me let me ask you a quick question, Fred. Sure. Are there, I mean, I know a lot of businesses recruit. Um, my business does. Lots of big companies recruit. Do they go out to college job fairs? Do they try yeah. to recruit teachers? I mean, go everywhere, go into the inner cities, go, I mean, everywhere you can find people and try to get people yeah. to tell them how great West Virginia is and get them out here? We do have that. I know that uh, our county in Kanawha County does that uh, from their uh, human resource departments. They do recruit. They go to job fairs, just like you said. Uh, but the, the sad news is we don't have as many students going into education in our colleges and universities. But uh, I know a few years ago they were giving some incentives to try to attract math teachers. Now it's it's in every discipline where we are experiencing shortages. So... To answer your question, Matt, uh, yes, counties do do that. Uh, but the downside is they don't have as many students in education uh, preparation, teacher preparation, as we once did. In a, a bit of in education or not, I mean, I would think with the, the dearth of teachers in this state, 
every college job fair, every job fair, you know, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Virginia, Maryland, every contig Tennessee, Kentucky, every contiguous state, every job fair should have a representative of the West Virginia state school system saying, hey, come to West Virginia. We would love to have you, whether they're education majors or not. Right. Well, I mean, I, that's a great suggestion. It's a great idea. I don't know how um, how the State Department does that. I know that Dr. Carla Warren does a fantastic job of uh, making our state look attractive and trying to attract uh, educators. So I, I speak to her all the time, and I'll be glad to. That, be, and, and she may do a great job, and I've heard yes. great things about her, but... Yes. As far as everything goes, we're losing right now. It's it's we scoreboard. It's the winning and losing. Yeah. You can you can do a great job, but if you're not winning, if it's not working, you got to do something well, different. I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, we've got to do something to to uh, correct this problem. There's nothing more important than educating our kids. I agree with you 100. percent Yes, that's sir. why I've given my life. That's why I've given my life. Yes, to you it. have, and done it well too, man. Fred, thanks so much Thank for your you. time this morning. As always, very much appreciated.